Hello, my name is Ricky and welcome to The Dev Method. Today's video, we talk about Rust structs. Rust structs are a common data structure that allow you to group together related values that represent something meaningful in your program. So structs are extremely common in Rust and you're working with them all the time. You'll need to understand how to work with them and how to create your own if you want to be a successful Rust programmer. So we're going to talk about creating your own structs, initializing instances of your structs, and adding associated functions to them. We've mentioned tuples a couple times in our video and structs are pretty close to them, but not exactly. However, instead of tuple elements, we have struct fields, and that's where you get to give a label to each of the values according to the, whatever value type they also have too. Structs are similar to tuples in that um, tuples have multiple elements and all of those elements can be different types. Structs actually have fields and they have names for them and then they also can have different types. So let me show you a small example of defining a struct. So here on line 18, um, we have what you write as struct, and then you give it a name. And then within the block here, you have these uh, different field names, and then separated by colon, space, and then the type of that field. And then after each one, there's a comma. And then the next line represents the, the next part of your struct. So we have here active, username, email, sign-in count. And they all have their own types, and you can have multiples of the same type. I thought it would be fun to also point out how this is very similar to other programming languages. So I have here an example of Swift. You have here a struct and a user, so pretty much so far the same. However, um, you go further uh, in some of these other programming languages where you're actually uh, putting like uh, mutability modifiers on these. So for example, let active means like you, this value would not change. So we'll see in the examples later how that's not totally how that works with structs in Rust. So here's another example, but in TypeScript, and uh, it's close to the equivalent. It's not exactly the same. Um, there's more that you can add to this that we're not looking at. Uh, however, this is roughly the same thing. So now that we've defined a struct, let's look at instantiating an instance of that struct. So we have here the user, and then we have the block right here. Um, now we're going to put all the field names, colon, and then some sort of value. And uh, at the end of the struct, you actually have a semicolon, because what we're saying is this is just a statement. We're not returning this in any way. Um, and it's going to be assigned to this variable uh, user1. Something to note here is that when you're in, um, instantiating this struct, the fields don't actually have to be in the same order as they were declared. So that's kind of cool. So note in this example, instead of just a let, it's actually a let mute. And so now user one actually uh, is allowing all of their fields to be mutated. So line 16 shows that there's user one dot email and then assigned to a completely different value. And just so you guys get an idea of using structs in functions, fairly easy. Here's a function called build user, and it's simply just returning um, an instance of user. Now, notice the uh, the build user has an email, and then it has a username as their parameters, and they're just directly passed into this struct. So Rust gives us a convenient shorthand for this. If you were to pass in a variable or just have a uh, a variable called email. And that's what also the field is called when you're instantiating the struct. You can actually just pass it in like so. This is very similar to what you can do in JavaScript and TypeScript. So if you want to create an instance of a struct of the same type, um, but you only want a couple of the fields changed, not all of them, there's actually an update syntax that Rust has built into the language. So if you're looking here, we have uh, the email, username, active, and sign in, all again in user1. But now let's say we want all the same properties, but we want uh, the email to be different. So here we are creating user2, and uh, we're actually just assigning it a different email. Here's the special part. We have two dots, two dots, and then username1. So Rust is smart enough to figure out that you want to replace email, but then any of the other values just go ahead and dump in from user1. This is very similar to the spread operator in JavaScript, but notice that the order here comes after the email if you want to override email. 
So for you guys who know what I'm talking about, this could, uh, this could mess you up. So pay attention to that. So this is kind of a review of ownership, but I just want to show you here, once we have user one, and then we've like done this update syntax to merge it into user two, the username is actually no longer available to us on that first struct. Um, but we do have the new email and all the other properties available to us from user two. So the error you would get actually is showing you that the value borrowed here after move. So all of these fields, all the ownership is then transferred in or moved into user two. Now this might seem a little sneaky, but because some of these values we're using here, like the bool and then that u64, they actually implement the copy trait. We actually can use them, we can access them safely. So if we tried to use user one active or user one email, the compiler has no problem us doing that. Now, naming is always the hardest part, right? So sometimes you don't know what to call your fields, or sometimes it's so obvious what the field should be called, right? Well, let's take a look at these structs and look at structs that have no field names. So here we have color, which what you might think is RGB. So there you go. Got the, and then you got points, so you maybe have X, Y, and Z. And here's an example of using them. So you, it looks almost like a function, like with a capital letter, and then you're just passing in the arguments here. Um, that's, how you, that's how you use those. So there are also union type structs without any fields. It might be a little strange to think about, but let's take a look. Here's an example from the Rust programming language book, um, a struct that's called always equal. And uh, we've instantiated it and it's called, well, it's in the variable subject. So this might actually be good to use for traits that don't necessarily have any data associated with them, but you want to then conform to the associated functions. Now traits will be covered in chapter 10 of the Rust programming language book. So let's talk a little bit about that ownership of the struct data. So we actually earlier used username and email as like the capital uh, S for string. Uh, so for example, it was like this. Right? So the whole idea of this is that um, we wanted to take ownership ourselves, but it is possible to let some sort of outside something have ownership over some of these field values. Now the thing is, right outside the box, uh, this actually will not compile. So let's take a look at the issue that it has. So it's specifying here that you need a lifetime parameter. So it almost looks like generics if you're used to something like Java or maybe even TypeScript. Um, and they start with this uh, s single quote and then some sort of letter or maybe multiple letters, some sort of identifier after it. And then you annotate it on the actual fields themselves. Lifetimes we're going to talk about later, so we're not ready for that. But those are also covered in Chapter 10 of the Rust Programming Language book. So let's take a step back and actually look at how structs can be useful. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with an example here that doesn't use a struct, and then we're going to work a struct into it and maybe why it might be easier to use it. So here we have a width and a height, and then we have an area that is calculated from the width and the height, and that is just a function. So we got the function there, takes the width and the height, calculates it, returns it, and then we print it out on the standard output. So another thing we could do is we could actually use tuples, right? So um, instead of doing two separate arguments, we just pass in the one, and now these two are associated together, the 30 and the 50. So the 30 is the width and the 50 is the height, and then you pass it in, um, and now the area, instead of taking two parameters, just takes the one, and it is a tuple. So the first one is assumed to be the width, and the second one is assumed to be the height. The problem with this is that it could be um, understood wrong by whoever's using your function or whoever's using your code. So that's why we want to use structs. We want to give this uh, context. But we also want to group the values together because they do relate to one another. That width and that height are never going to be different from one another. They don't, we want to collect them together. So now we got our struct here, the rectangle, got the width and the height. And then we instantiate the struct on line 9. And then we're passing it in to area. And then area can calculate it. So now instead of calling area and forgetting if width is first or second or something like that, um, we have the rect which is a rectangle, and it has those things labeled to it. So you know that it's called width, you know that it's called height, you know what the values are, they're assigned correctly, and then you pass it into area and it calculates it. So that's the advantage instead of using just 
single variables themselves, grouping the variables in, in tuples, um, grouping together, collecting together in a struct. So something you probably tried already was that you wanted to print out your struct and see the values that are inside of it. So let's look at this example. We have rect1, and then we're just going to print it out on the command line. So let's try this, see what happens. So cargo run. Oh no, we have a build error. So rectangle cannot be formatted with the default format error. So notice here it says rectangle doesn't implement uh, this from the standard library format and then display. So this is our custom data type. So we're the ones responsible to saying like what it conforms to or how it should look if we were to print it out as a string. So we're going to take a little shortcut on this, though. We're not going to implement display, but rather we're actually going to use this uh, special thing here um, and annotate our struct with a debug trait. And it's saying derive. So there's an automatic capability that Rust has right now to like take this and make it into a string representation, but not until we actually put in this hash open square bracket derive thing. And if you look at line 14, uh, the difference that we had from before was that this was just uh, empty. Those wing braces were empty in the format string. Now we have colon question mark. And then that's going to make that work. So let's try it. So ignoring the warnings, uh, they're just talking about other things like dead code. But here we have uh, the, the rectangle printed out as a string in the console. Pretty sweet. And if you want to experiment, uh, if you put not only just the colon question mark, but colon hash question mark, that actually gives you a longer output. So instead of on uh, just one line as a single string, it'll do multiple lines as a string. So another really cool one we could use here too is actually uh, dbg for debug. It actually prints out the expression and the calculated value that it has. So it's pretty cool. Let me just show you real quick what happens when we run this program. We're going to see a printout with the width but then we're going to also see a printout of the rectangle as well. So here's that expression, and then it says it equals 60, so that's kind of cool. Now it also took that value and put it into width, so that's pretty sweet. Um, and then you see that here. And notice it shows here that the reference to uh, rect1 is actually equal to these values in the rectangle. All right, so we've stored the stuff inside the struct. We've also said what the types are. Um, we've updated structs, we've made new ones, we instantiated them, all sorts of stuff, right? Well, now let's take a step further and let's do some associated functions with them. In this example, I want to call your attention to line 7 because now we have a new syntax and we're taking that area function that used to be just like a global function that you give it a rectangle. We're going to now associate that with an actual rectangle. So here it is written out. We have a uh, impl. You want to think of that as like implementation. And then right now, this will get more com complicated in the future, but it's just going to say the struct name. And then you have the uh, implementation block. We have uh, the function declaration, very similar to what we had before. But if we use this uh, reference self here, we now can actually go back and get the width and the height for the rectangle that we are now. So that's what self is used for. And then it's annotating the return type, of course, but uh, it returns this. Now, it is a reference to self because we as the struct don't want to take ownership of our own value. If we wanted to do that, that would be more like uh, we're transforming a value um, and, and we're going to return a different one. So we usually don't do that. That's actually kind of rare in Rust. But another way you could do this too, um, so yeah, it could have self, you could have the reference to self, which is probably the most common. Um, another really common one is going to be a reference to mutable self. So maybe this is like, you know, um, calculate the area and then also set the width back to like zero or something. So you'd be able to do that. So you might say to yourself, like, why would I put area inside the implementation block? And why don't I just keep it outside as a global function? And honestly, I think that that is an opinion of yours. Um, it doesn't matter which, which way you go. It, it's going to work both ways. Uh, you might want to think of like discoverability of your um, developer experience. So like, for example, if I instantiated something and then I have a method I always want to use with it, the autocomplete might come up. So I do dot and then area comes up and some other associated functions that have been defined come up. Instead of like maybe hunting around in the documentation or trying to like do some autocompletion um, around the top with the use, 
and, and try and figure out like what the global functions are that you might want to use. So yeah, it's completely up to you. You do whichever way you want. Try them both ways so you get familiar with it because you're going to see both as you write your own programs and the, you're going to see it as when you read other people's Rust programs as well. So here's something that's pretty cool. Uh, you could actually name, I'm showing you uh, line seven again, but now instead of width, we or instead of area, we have width. And uh, this is the same name as actually the field that we have. Now the difference here is that um, width is like called like a function. Um, and now we're just returning a bool for now, just so you get an idea of, of what it's doing. So here it's like uh, rect.width, and then it returns a bool, so we can use it in that if statement, um, returning something that's non-zero. So this is kind of like a getter, and it's it's almost like uh, giving your your uh, the user of the rect a read-only access, because uh, sometimes you know you might not know exactly that this is a rectangle and that it has width. Um, this could be something that's defined somewhere else, and now you have the width, and you can always get to it with the uh, function call instead, the associated function. But then you can think of this too as like if this is the way you're always getting width, um, there's no way to set that. You're always just getting it. So modifiers are actually covered in uh, chapter seven of the Rust programming language book. So you can check it out there if you want, or you'll see that in the future. So now uh, let's take it a little step further. Notice here we have the implementation block again on line seven. Uh, we have the area, I've put that back in from before, but now we have this new one called can hold. Notice this one is multiple parameters. So you actually can give it another rectangle, right? So this self here is kind of like a capital S self. So that's how we get the, the width. But then now we have this other. So now we can say, oh, is the width greater than the other's width? And is the height greater than the other's height? So we can use the same type within that associated function. So kind of cool you can do that. All right, so back on line seven, um, I've took, taken away the other associated functions because I want to show you a special one. This one square actually doesn't have a reference to self. There is no self here. So if we want to use it on line 17, I have here uh, just the rectangle, which is the struct, and then we have uh, colon, colon, and then that name of that associated function. So this means that we have no chance to necessarily uh, you know, reference self in this case, but um, now we're giving it like, say I want a rectangle, but I want a specialized rectangle. So give me a square. And then it sets the width and the height to the same size because it only passes in the one value. So something you can do, which um, it's up to you at this point, uh, line seven here has got an implementation block, but then also line 13 has one too. So you can actually have multiple implementation blocks. So you don't have to put them all into one. You could think of it as maybe organization, um, this is a little bit more for when you want to conform to different traits. So maybe like the first ones to like the copy trait and the other ones to like, I don't know, the shape trait that you create later. Uh, that's how you can separate them. So now you know all these functions are like for one type of implementation versus another. So again, traits will come in the future, but um, just so you know, you can, you'll see this and that's where that comes from. All right, thanks for sticking around and watching that whole video about structs. So if you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer those questions for you. Um, and I uh, hope you had a good one and you learned something new. See ya.